Welcome everybody to the this month's Jilla Colloquium. Welcome if you're a staff, welcome if you're a student. <laughs> now I'm in the welcome if you're researchers, welcome whoever you are from whatever place you come from. Thanks for attending this. As you know, this particular colloquium series is designed not to showcase how brilliant the speaker is, but rather to try and share the excitement of all the amazing things that are happening in Jilla today in each of the many groups. Margaret Murnane and Henry Captain joined us 20 years ago. It seems like yesterday to me, but it was 1999. They brought with them a new program of research in Jilla, which had not been seen before. It was on high energy lasers. They built up, they've built up a large group and they do an amazing amount of stuff. I can't believe how much they managed to take on. And it's a great pleasure that they're able to spend some time today to share with us what their group is doing. You may see numerous strobe type lectures being advertised within Jilla. These are the people who are making that happen. Not only do they lead a large research group, but they have also pioneered diversity and inclusion issues within Jilla. And we're very thankful for that. Moreover, they have established a company, KM Labs, which connects to the outside world. They're doing all the things that one might hope that brilliant researchers would do. I'm not going to go through a list of awards because that would be like saying how brilliant they are. But all I can say is I have an office next door to them and I can assure you that you can't see the walls because they're all wallpapered with awards. <laughs> okay, Margaret and Henry, I believe Margaret is going to be the speaker today. Thank you very much. Let's give them a warm welcome. You have 40 minutes, 40 minutes. and 20 and then we'll have 15 to 20 minutes of questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much, Andrew. Should I uh, turn down the dimmer? Thank you. So it is really great to be here today and see some of you in person and some of you um, online by Zoom. Uh, it's great to feel like we're coming out of the pandemic and can begin to resume normal activities. And uh, in my talk today, I'd like to present uh, just a real team effort uh, on building the microscopes of tomorrow, or as Henry likes to say, the quest for the ultimate light-based microscope. And in my slides today, you're going to see data that was taken by our group. Um, they're an amazing set of individuals. You're going to see grants and graphics and uh, things built in the shops, the instrument shop, electronic shop, um, and, and of course, uh, HR, just many things here at Jilla that uh, makes this work possible. We, I'll also be talking about work from alumni uh, work for KM Labs was instrumental in helping us, and also from many collaborators. So this is not something one can, this type of research is not something one can attempt within a single group, and I hope to be able to explain why that is as I go along. And so th these are pictures of the last in-person strobe retreat. This was at uh, UCLA in uh, November of 2019, so just got in under. Um, and of course, these are all pictures from the group because we haven't, we've met in small teams, but not as a big group. So we'll have to update that picture as soon as we can uh, do full group meetings in person. So I'll be talking about microscopy today. And of course, uh, we know from very recent events, it's, it's critical, you know, to look at viruses, vaccines, also for nanotechnologies, energy technologies, next generation quantum technologies, we, we need microscopes. Um, and uh, we actually need better microscopes. Uh, one of our colleagues at UCLA uh, was working with Moderna to image their uh, vaccine over the last two years. The first image he took of the Moderna vaccine took two months. And of course you could imagine, it and that was using a commercial, 
electron microscope with an amazing ability to handle a lot of data so they could image the um, modification that, mo that Moderna made to, so that their vaccine could survive at higher temperatures than the Pfizer. And one can imagine if one could increase the speed and utility of microscopes, it could make a big difference in our ability to combat new variants and such. And similarly with energy technology, battery technology, uh, nano microelectronics and next generation quantum, it's very hard to see what we need to see in order to make that those technologies better. So we just we do need to invent microscopes that and let us see and let us see better. And essentially that's what that's what we pitched to NSF for the Strobe Science and Technology Center that uh, if you if you have a material and you know the, like for example, thin films, they're ubiquitous in manufacturing and such. If your film is super thin, it's very hard to know what the mechanical properties of that um, film is, if it's five nanometers or less. You know, conventional methods would use what's called a, a nano indentation, where you would just press on the material. But if the material is so thin that if you press on it, you actually measure the mechanical properties of the substrate. And that's just one example. There's lots of other examples that people are using, you know, visible lasers like I'm holding in my hand and trying to learn about materials on deep atomic to nanoscale dimensions. And you just can't interpret the light that's scattered. Uh, it, you can only interpret it if you already understand a lot about the materials and the biological science, but then you're in a catch-22. You can't see, so you can make a model, you can analyze the data with a model, but you don't know if it's correct. And so there's two challenges we're trying to address in strobe. The first is we need to be able to make, measure, and integrate materials with near perfect interfaces. And we don't have ways of looking at those interfaces and watching how, how the structure uh, dictates the function. You know, this is, could be charge or spin or heat traveling across a device. So we don't have ways of, of doing that. And the second challenge we're trying to address is we need a biological microscope that where we don't need to alter or kill the sample. So if you think about ways that people can look at, you know, vaccines, viruses, other biological specimens, you either freeze it and use electron microscopy, in which case the sample is dead, or you tag a fluorescent protein onto it, in which case you have a big, big anchor on the protein you're trying to study. There is amazing work you know, done using these techniques uh, and recent Nobel Prizes on them. So it's, it's not that they are not amazing, but what if we could do make a biomicroscope where it was sufficiently low dose that we didn't kill the sample and we could look at a, biologist, a cell or a component of a cell working in vitro. These are pretty hard challenges. So what, at Strobe, we're trying to make microscopes and methods that can see better and see in real time. So we can you know, watch a nano device or a biological um, entity as it works. So, okay, so what wavelength should we use? And if we're talking about microscopy, we want to see very small things, um, uh, uh, organisms, virus, atoms, um, and so you might think, well, uh, it turns out that the uh, COVID virus is about 100 nanometers in diameter. But if you want to see the spike protein that you know causes the trouble and, and allows it to infect cells, you maybe you want a nanometer resolution, or or actually you would like even better. But let's settle. Let's be happy with the nanometer for now, which is not possible using light-based microscopes. Um, and then, so you could, so what wavelength do you need to get a spatial resolution of a nanometer? So we've known for quite a long time that if we build a perfect microscope, then the spatial resolution we can achieve with that perfect microscope is about half the illumination wavelength. And so that means that if we're talking about high resolution imaging of viruses or nanostructures, we should be looking at wavelengths in this region here of the spectrum between 100 nanometers and, um, and, and an angstrom. And then we could get a spatial resolution of anywhere between 
50 nanometers and sub nanometer spatial resolution. So why don't we have those microscopes now? We've had x-rays for a while. We've had short wavelength light for a while. Um, it's because there, there are pretty um, fundamental challenges that have been around for 60 years or more. First, there is no good x-ray lens available. Um, you know, you, we can go um, to Thor Labs or other vendors and be able to essentially buy a perfect lens for visible imaging or a microscope objective and such. And they're not even that expensive, but there's no such components available in the X-ray region. Um, as you could imagine, the, the surface quality and the polish that one would need is just not possible and the accuracy of, to, of the optics. On top of that, we know that X-rays um, can damage uh, biological, soft matter or biological structures. And uh, say if we want to go, so this will be useful when we compare with electron microscopy, uh, a, a nanometer wavelength that might let us get a sub nanometer spatial resolution image that corresponds to a photon energy of about a kilo electron volt. Okay. So we have to, if we want to look at structures all the way from angstroms uh, to hundreds of nanometers and do that in real time, we have to use both light-based microscopes and electron-based microscopes. And that's why Strobe uses and studies and advances both types of microscopy. And I just grabbed these from the web. This is just a, a light-based microscope you might have used uh, in high school. And this is an electron microscope. Um, and you know, in, from the point of view of the microscope itself, you've got uh, e illumination either by light or electrons. You've got some focusing lenses in, in both cases, and then the sample, and then uh, you have a, 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 an, a, an eyepiece lens that makes the image. And we, they're microscopes. We build microscopes that work both in transmission and in reflection. Um, so let's take a look at the history of electron microscopy and see you know, what are its limits. So uh, Thomson discovered the electron way back in 1987 and 1897, did I say that right? Yes, did I say 1997? Thank you. <sighs> okay. And then in 1924, De Broglie postulated that electrons can behave like waves and Davs and Gamer, Germer confirmed the wave particle duality of electrons. And that means we can think about a high energy electron as having a wavelength of Planck's constant divided by P. If the electron has um, uh, an energy on order of a hundred kilo electron volts, uh, then its wavelength is well below an angstrom. And so we've got the possibility of building an electron microscope um, of course, for a microscope, you need a lens. Um, Bush developed the first electromagnetic lens that can focus electron beams in 1926. And in 1933, Ruska built the first electron microscope that could get to a spatial resolution better than any light-based microscope. And then, of course, between then and now, is, there's been just multiple revolutions in electron imaging. So, in fact, uh, Ruska got the Nobel Prize uh, back in 86, 1986, um, having built the first uh, electron microscope that, that achieved uh, a spatial resolution better than a light based microscope back in 33. And, uh, you know, this technology is still advancing due to advances in electron lenses, detectors, electron sources, and such. And, in fact, our collaborator at UCLA, Jiang Miao, did something that was uh, uh, extremely, extremely important recently and that was published in Nature and Nature Materials, is that he was able to make a, an image to, um, at, with atomic and species resolution. This, and this is a particle of glass. Glass is a very hard material to image at this kind of resolution because it's it's inhomogeneous. It, it doesn't have any long scale order. So X-ray diffraction that lets you uh, extract the uh, structure of a crystal will not work. 
So for this type of imaging, one has to take an electron microscope, use very specialized methods to uh, analyze the, um, the, the image. And then uh, this is of tens of thousands of atoms uh, in, a, in a particle of glass. And what he was able to find is that that the glass is not um, a uniform order. So it has regions that have short range order, regions that have mid range order, and a whole pile about seven different types of little, I won't call them crystallites because they're not, but they're different types of regions that are somewhat like polymers. And so this was a, a tour de force um, in terms of uh, advancing electron imaging. So why? don't we have electron microscopes everywhere? Um, it is uh, because they have, well, we do, they are everywhere, <laughs> but, and they can get an amazing resolution. This is the spatial resolution. The location of these atoms, say in this nanoparticle can go down to picometer level. So it's absolutely mind boggling, but there is a problem. Uh, to get this resolution, you need to use quite high energy electrons and those electrons are every bit as damaging as an X-ray of this energy. In, in fact, uh, it, it, you need about a factor of 10 higher electron energy to get an equivalent resolution as, as you could in theory with an X-ray. So the, uh, the damage is the big a big problem. Um, and uh, on top of that, there's a whole lot of other things that if you want to put a sample in an electron microscope, you need to coat it with platinum and other things. And so you're, you're actually often changing the sample on top of that. Uh, however, it is still amazing, uh, still an amazing technique and continues to have amazing advances. For example, of course, the, the way people got around the sample damage in electron microscopy is to freeze it, freeze the samples because then especially biological samples that would be very sensitive to these high energy electrons. And cryo-electron microscopy got the Nobel Prize in 2017. And then just uh, two years later or thereabouts, it was used to uh, uh, make an image, the COVID-19 spike protein at three and a half angstroms resolution. And this happened extremely fast, I think within there were paper pub, papers published on bioarchive within a couple of months after the uh, COVID-19 um, detection. And, it, and as I mentioned, one of our uh, strobe faculty members, Hong Zhao at UCLA, Moderna approached him because Hong was able to achieve spatial resolutions of less than two angstroms, so even better than that spike protein imaging. And the reason why is um, he had very powerful supercomputers, so they can take 200 images, say, of the Moderna vaccine and then use that to push the spatial resolution so you can actually see uh, the modification on the, uh, on the vaccine that makes, the, make, makes it more robust. So Hong and his uh, team were working uh, in the summer of 2020 when, oh, and the spring of 2020 when the rest of us were at home pretty much working on, on uh, getting images to Moderna. He, worked, he wor is working with them for over two years now. Um, he can't publish the results. They, they do pay for the service, but of course, you know, having the capability there so they could get the image quickly was very important for all of us. So I think this is definitely a case where we're, we're thankful to him and you know, we'd love to see, you know, the, the images that he could take, but, but uh, we won't see them now. What he'd really like um, to be able to do is to push the spatial resolution of electron microscopy to the, the sub-molecular level. That, for that, he needs about another factor of four in resolution. Um, that's a factor of 10 in data, and they've already pushed the data limits to as much as can be reasonably done. So what um, uh, Jiang Miao and Laura Waller and a bunch of people we're now doing is sort of seeing what techniques can we use to be able to, to extract more from a li limited set of data. We're not the only ones trying to do that. I mean, that's, that's very common ac across many areas of science and technology. 
Okay, so let's talk about x-rays. Um, and so, you know, a very similar timeline. Um, uh, Runken uh, discovered x-rays back in 1895. Uh, the Braggs developed x-ray crystallography around 1912. Um, Kirkpatrick Baez made the first x-ray microscope in 1948. Uh, that's neat. And the other claim to fame Baez has is that he's uh, Joan Baez's dad. <laughs> so, and, uh, so, and then, of course, uh, x-rays were used to make all kinds of discoveries, uh, for example, were used to uncover the double helix structure of DNA by Rosalind Franklin and co-workers. But like electrons, there's advantages and disadvantages of using x-rays to illuminate a microscope. Um, as I mentioned before, the big problem is there's, there is no way to make a lens that, an x-ray lens that's, or, or a focusing optic that is anywhere near perfect. And that's why this um, proposal here, where Sayer proposed lensless imaging, was actually very important. At the time, people didn't realize it was important because no microscope had, had, was anywhere near the resolution that are available today. But it's quite important. And of course, we use x-rays for imaging in many, um, in security and medical um, protein crystallography and such. If you look at, you know, what, you know, what wavelengths these correspond to, you know, the one kV is a nanometer, 10 kV is sub nanometer, but, you know, in your doctor or dentist's office, uh, there, or in any science or technology lab, there is no microscope that can go to half the resolution of the wavelength being used because of this problem of just no perfect x-ray lenses. And fortunately, um, in the past 10 years or so, that situation is completely changing. So in a traditional x-ray microscope that, you know, been around for the past 60 or 70 years, um, your spatial resolution is limited by the optics to about 10 times the theoretical limit. And uh, Sayer's proposal was to, at the time, the, it wasn't available. So this is why he was a theorist looking forward you know, uh, by decades. Um, essentially, what he said is if you take a coherent beam, so a laser-like beam that's directed just like my laser pointer, and uh, shine it on a sample and collect the scattered light, um, normally you would use a lens to reform an image of the object. But instead, he proposed use what's called a phase retrieval algorithm that, and then use a computer algorithm to recover the image. And in the last 10 years or so, our group and multiple groups around the world, um, in fact, every x-ray facility is now switching to this form of lensless imaging. And it's really giving rise to the first uh, near-perfect x-ray microscopes. And on top of that, we get all the other advantages of x-rays. You know, they penetrate to ob through objects. Um, you can tell from their absorption edges what elements you're looking at or what their chemical state is, what their magnetic state is. Um, you can do non-destructive imaging. You, in many cases, you don't have to cut out a sample like you have to do with electron imaging. And if you have coherence, uh, you can get to the diffraction limit and also um, do that stroboscopically. So you can watch your biosystem or your nanosystem actually um, do its job. So the big problem when Sarah proposed this back in 1952, it's of course particularly suitable for x-rays because we don't have perfect x-ray lenses. One can certainly use it with visible light also, but there you have a lens, you can recover a real image, so the advantage of doing a computational image is where it takes a lot of computer time is not as strong. And so um, the problem back in 1952 is that we didn't have uh, easy access to lasers at any wavelength because the first uh, laser was demonstrated back in 1960 by Ted Maiman. And that was uh, in uh, the 
uh, infrared, near infrared region of the spectrum. And in the intervening time since 1960, um, the shortest wavelength laser that's in widespread use is the excimer laser that has a wavelength of just under 200 nanometers. So it's one of the areas of science and technology where there's hardly been any advances. It's, we've, we've decreased the wavelength of lasers by less than a factor of four in you know, 60 years. And that's why the tabletop light sources, um, the short wave and light sources that our group develops and uses at Jilla are quite interesting because it is a way to be able to make laser light beams that go from the ultraviolet to a nanometer. And if we could make a microscope with a nanometer spatial resolution, that would be just um, quite amazing. Um, so we take a femtosecond laser where they're available commercially in many cases and focus into a gas jet. And then that's very like um, the process in many green laser pointers that puts that is an infrared laser with a nonlinear crystal where you add two infrared photons together to get a green photon. Here we have to add up to 5,000 laser photons together to make an X-ray photon. But we, if you do that properly, you, you do get a beam out that's really great for illuminating these lensless microscopes. And uh, I probably won't go into the quantum physics just so I can finish in the next 12 minutes or so, but you can think about a femtosecond laser as plucking the quantum wave function of an electron in the ground state of hydrogen. So just like when, if you pluck a guitar string and you pluck it gently, you get the fundamental tone. You can think about the femtosecond laser plucking the guitar string, or in this case, the electron wave function really hard. So you get not only the fundamental frequency radiated, but also harmonics of that light. The other analogy you can make is that this uh, way we use to upconvert femtosecond lasers um, into X-rays are essentially what you'd come up with if you asked uh, how could you make the Röntgen X-ray tube coherent. You would start with a coherent state, accelerate electrons, and then uh, encounter the um, target. And if you, we do that essentially with the electrons in an atom. And because we use a femtosecond laser, we get essentially the fastest strobe lights in existence because we use a femtosecond laser that can capture a, a, you know, phonon frequencies and electron uh, transitions and interactions. And because we convert to much higher frequencies, we end up with a uh, attoseconds or sub femtosecond x-rays, x-ray bursts that can be used to capture any dynamics in the material. And we have absolutely superb control over that light. I told you that there were not very good X-ray optics available, but we've learned how to use optics in the visible and condition the femtosecond laser we're using to drive this process. And then we can generate X-rays that have, that have polarization shaping, spectral shaping, temporal sh shaping, more recently, um, orbital angular, angular momentum shaping. So we use lasers in the visible to impart any characteristics on X-ray light, which is very useful because we don't have very good optics there. Okay, so uh, how do we make the uh, lensless microscope? So in a regular microscope, um, in an X-ray tube or CAT scan and such, uh, we, I, I mentioned that the lossy and imperfect object optics gives you a resolution of 10 times the wavelength of the light. So instead we focus in the lensless microscope, we focus the light onto an object. This is a visible image, but just to give you the idea, focus on, onto an object, collect the scatter pattern, and then the shape of that scatter pattern is related to the uh, shape of the light on the object and the shape of the object itself. And uh, Kathy Perkins, uh, I, I uh, encourage you to explore the FET applets that um, Kathy and Ariel worked with Strobe on developing, um, just showing that, uh, th that the characteristic pattern that one produces if you have uh, a, a coherent 
beam incident on um, an object, and these here it's wave interferences. The pattern of the wave interference is um, is very characteristic of how why these slits are and what the um, the separation of the slits are. And this is when we illuminate with a um, a wave that is coherent. In other words, the crest is arriving at these two parts of the object at the same time. And essentially, that's what we do with the lenses microscope. We illuminate an object with a laser-like beam, and then the scatter pattern is very characteristic of what the object is made from. And uh, Michael made this for me, but the movies don't work. But just showing it just doesn't work as well if you don't use a laser-like beam. So these are two beams going through sugar water. And if it's incoherent, you get a big blur. You can't really tell what's the shape of the glass or what's in the water. But if you use a laser, you can tell um, the shape, the scatter pattern encodes both the shape of the glass and what the size of the particles are. It's very similar this to, you know, when you see colors on a soap bubble, then they encode the thickness of the bubble. So, uh, again, emphasize why is lenses imaging so powerful? Um, one of the reasons is we don't just take an amplitude image of an object. In your high school microscope, you put the sample into the microscope and you get an amplitude image. And when we use a computer algorithm um, to uh, recover the image, we get an amplitude and phase image. And there's a huge amount of information encoded in the phase. So let's take an uh, image of our bunny. So we make a Fourier transform, which tells us what the light scatter pattern should look like. And because we did it on a computer, we know the phase also. Now let's throw away all the phase information. It doesn't look very useful anyway. And re-invert with just the phase, a constant phase across the scatter pattern. And if we look at our bunny, you couldn't really tell that was a bunny. Uh, you might, this might look a little bit like the ears, but you really couldn't tell it's a bunny. But if instead you take your bunny and now throw away the amplitude information, but keep the phase and now reinvert, and it turns out you get a bunny and an inverted bunny. And there are ways that we can use uh, computation to separate these two images. So it, the phase has a huge amount of additional information. So a lensless microscope can give you much more information than we can get just with the regular microscope. This is to make the students cry. No, I'm just joking. This was Sayer's full paper back in 1952. This, this was the full paper. And look at the look at the last two, look at the last sentence. <laughs> we could not get away with writing this in a publication these days. The referees would kill us. But the other interesting thing is that Sayer proposed this in 52, and there was a lot of computation advances needed. The first experiment to do this was done by our colleague, John Miao, uh, for his thesis work at um, Brookhaven. And Sarah was a co-author. So this is from 52 to 99. And because it took that long to be able to put a pinhole in a bright synchrotron beam that you could actually make a laser-like, you know, um, coherent illumination. And some really important advances. So, so that first experiment was done in 1999, but for a long time, the images just didn't look that good. And material scientists were very skeptical that if you, what people used to do, uh, because the algorithms were not that good, they would make 200 images of the sample and average them. And of course, no material science, scientist wants an average image of their sample. They want the image of the sample. And so this, events that's called tychography. Our field has, um, has interesting names. The idea is if you scan the beam, but with a lot of overlap, then the algorithm, uh, you've over prescribed the problem. The algorithm has a lot of redundant data. And now the images correlate really, really well with any other type of microscopy. And we can often see more that you can't see in other types of microscopies. So essentially what we have now is the need to build microscopes with better hardware, really sophisticated software. And in fact, lots of the software are the same for the electron microscopes and for the X-ray microscope. 
many of the algorithms are similar. All these modern advanced microscopes, they don't make direct images. You, you look at these blurry patterns, you wonder how, I can't imagine that there's actual data there, but there, there is. And it's allowing us, and by us, I mean, you know, the group, the collaborators, um, to discover very new things and propose microscopes um, that are just could have quite amazing capabilities. There's a new microscope that we're working with Dick McIntosh and Ralph Imenez on, um, funded by the Moore Foundation, which is to take a four nanometer illumination, um, and that's only a photon energy of around 280 eV. That can make much less damage on a biological sample than 100 kV um, electron or photon. In principle, with lenses imaging, we can go to two nanometer spatial resolution. And so that may allow us to do biological imaging in vitro and in vivo. That would be hard. If, if, if we do that, we would be ecstatic. <laughs> and so um, I think we are. Um, uh, just in the interest of time, since I showed that other slide um, be, uh, before. So we're building the microscopes of tomorrow to be able to look at the materials and the biosystems of tomorrow. And uh, all the way from electronics to nanostructures, thermoelectrics. And I want to in particular mention work that was done by Josh and Brendan and Emma and uh, same team and Michael, Yuka, Nick, and Chrissy in just uh, being able to measure things that there are no other ways of measuring, uh, looking at nanoscale heat transport, where in the past people would have thought that uh, heat would travel, uh, would spread diffusively, so you would get spreading out in the nanoscale if you uh, structured the geometry correctly, you can actually force heat to channel. That allows one to implement reasonable thermal management. That's very important because a lot of efficiencies in devices are related to their, and their the performance are related to being able to control the temperature and, and take heat away. That was a, um, a, a th that got a lot of pushback the first time the uh, Nico, some of you will, will remember Nico uh, went to uh, Materials Research Society and presented this. The engineers all said, uh, this can't be true. And then a couple of years later, they said, okay, we see it with visible light, but you must be interpreting it wrong. And then another three years later, they said, okay, we see it. We agree there's, you can actually do this. So it was one of those things when you see something new, like in many aspects of just regular life, not to my science, uh, people often push back because they just don't understand it. And all of this requires a huge amount of big data, which is why we're always bothering the computing team because we need, we, we need so much help. Um, some of our images uh, take uh, a 12 terabyte of data. Um, but this uh, understanding heat transport is quite important because although the number of transistors on a chip is, has increased considerably, the clock speed hasn't because they can't manage the heat. Um, Okay, so with that, um, I think I'm going to move to my last few slides, just so I can finish in um, on time. One of the things we particularly love at Strobe is that, uh, you know, people are coming to us with uh, problems that they, uh, imaging science problems that they can't solve themselves. Uh, now this usually starts off then a two-year project because we may not have the exact microscope that's needed, but we're happy to build it. That's our research. And we learn so much about um, challenges in other areas of science. I think one of the neat ones, I, I talked about Moderna and you can imagine with some of the other ones, you know, we want to look at battery materials and other kinds of materials. But I think a neat one recently was that um, the folks building tokamaks came because they want to be able to detect damage on the walls of the tokamak from the high energy he helium atoms. And um, Michael and Yuka and Nick were, were able to actually see um, the signature of uh, damage by helium ions by just scattering a shortwave version of this um, uh, uh, laser pointer. It, 
And so I'm going, I, Andrew, I promise I'm going to um, finish with uh, this movie. This is work we're, we're doing in uh, working with the X-ray synchrotron at Berkeley, uh, where we're imaging the 3D spin texture in a uh, nickel metal lattice where that supports a lot of beautiful topologically uh, protected textures. So you, you're seeing the magnetic field in the nickel, nickel metal lattice, and uh, you can see the swirling structures. We can correlate that with how we expect the structure of this metal lattice um, to support. So this is related to some of the Spintronic and Skirmion um, devices that you might have heard about. This was a four-year project. And so I'll end um, building microscopes like building clocks is not from the faint hearted. It's um, uh, it, the, one goes through many days where the experiment is not working as our students well know, but uh, you know, if we say nice things to the microscopes, they eventually work. This is uh, the first Varian um, commercial NMR, NMR spectroscopy uh, spectrometer. Um, Henry likes to emphasize, this is for the junior folks in the audience, that it took 50 years to go from the observation to commercialization. It takes a long time, but there's just so much interesting work to do with other people on the way. And so the time scale should not put us off. And uh, you know, along the way, we can work with amazing teams, amazing students. And I'd like to thank, you know, um, the Jilla team, our group members, alumni, and collaborators for making this work a real joy to do every day. Thank you. Thank you so much, Margaret, for a, a wonderful colloquium. If you have a, a question, you can raise your hand, and I have a microphone which will allow you question to be heard by the Zoom people. If you're on Zoom, Tyler McMacken is watching the chat. So who would like to ask the first question? Yes, go ahead. Hi, uh, can you say a few words on how the uh, computer reconstructs the image from the phases? Um, so uh, it's an iterative phase retrieval algorithm. And so essentially you can start with assigning random phases to the um, scatter pattern and then make an inverse Fourier transform. And then um, let's see, inverse Fourier transform. And then in the next step, um, apply any constraints, because you may know that, let's say the sample is located in a particular region or some such, um, or, you, or you may have taken a, a picture of your beam, so you can add that in. Um, and then uh, take another inverse Fourier transform um, and then replace the uh, uh, extracted intensity uh, with the actual experimentally measured intensity and then do another Fourier transform and that's in its simple form. So for example, uh, the constraint of if you know your sample is located in a different region means that any intensity um, that is uh, that, that you uh, get in your computed Fourier transform that's outside a certain re region is not real. And so that is it turns out is not sufficiently strong a constraint. So the tychography constraint, which means you have a bunch of um, uh, diffraction patterns from spatially overlapping regions and the part that are overlapping need to look the same. That's a much more powerful constraint. Is it, is it a, a, a convergent process or is it something like a random walk? Uh, it, it, can, can, it can converge and one can play so many tricks beyond what you know. Um, um, I've talked about. You, uh, and it, it, what is wonderful is that actually, if it doesn't converge, it actually tells you something about the microscope. So for example, in that last image or, or a version of the last image that I showed at Cosmic, we weren't getting convergence. And then the students said, well, what if we say there's two beams there and not one? 
And then we realized, oh my goodness, there was two beams there because the microscope had a little bit was a little bit out of focus. And so, um, uh, so, so it's very powerful because you can correct aberrations, correct things with the setup computationally without having to design you know, an aberration free um, imaging system. Thank you. So there are a few questions in the chat already. Uh, Graham was asking a similar question about how long it takes to um, extract, to back out an image if you have terabytes of data. Oh, um, that is years. <laughs> but we're, um, it's, okay. Uh, in a, so it can be months for simple. You know, if we're just doing a 2D image, it's, you know, we can do those very quickly. If you have a 3D tomographic image, you have to align the images together. And, and sometimes automation works, but if your image is weakly, if, if it's a skirmion structure where you only have magnetic contrast, that can take a long time. And we're developing the methods as we do them. So the first time doesn't tell you exactly what the microscope is capable of, because the first time with anything is slow, but it can go anywhere from near real time, but you can get rough images that don't do the whole spatial resolution, you can get rough 2D images in almost real time. But that is not the ultimate, they're not as good. But it does all, it all uses like GPUs and GPU clusters. So it's really enabled by advances in computing. So we're trying to give back in a sense, if we can do use these microscopy techniques to design better computers. We'll, <laughs> we'll work out better also. And the other thing is, you know, detectors. Um, so CCDs work great for astronomy, but they're not fast. And for a long time, we had to use CCD cameras and the readout for the frame could be half an hour. Now with the CMOS cameras that we all have in our cell phones, they're being adapted for the shore wave and light we're using and that's that is essentially what will make the live live biological imaging possible because you can read out fast so the you don't have to illuminate the sample with huge amounts of x-rays great thanks and one more uh, beth writes you've had great success in improving the diversity of your group what might you say has had the most significant impact on this I would say that that's Margaret herself. No, so. no, no. Um, so it's, I, I think it's just very simple. Um, you know, you work better, people work better when they're happy and when they're having fun. And so you just design, you, you design projects so that there's easy parts, medium parts and crazy parts. But if your PhD doesn't depend on the crazy part, you can take that risk. And every PhD student we've had has um, just surprised us. I just love the surprise when the experiment totally turns out a different way than you expect. Because, and in many cases, it's actually quite important. <laughs> but, but it means that it's usually better, exactly. But that's what's amazing about science, yeah. That it's often better than we can imagine, the actual situation. But it's, you know, how do you do this? Well, discovery science, you, you have to not have a, so I, I will get back to diversity. You have to not completely believe the status quo, right? Because if you do, you, that's how you will think. And you know, by the status quo, I'm, I mean, you know, what people accept are the limits or how things work. And, and so it's related to diversity. You can't have very strong, um, uh, you know, um, concepts of either how you do science or who do, does science, if you really want to have a lot of fun and that's the way to push the envelope. Uh, this is from David Nesbitt. He says, when you kept the phase but flattened the amplitude, you got the outline of the bunny doubled by inversion. <laughs> uh, I presume you get all much better both. Uh, I, I presume you get all much better if you use both. How would you gauge the information content of amplitude versus phase? Clearly show phase is not trivial. Yep, you're absolutely right, David. And you know, it, it also depends on the sample. 
you know, because some samples almost always you get better phase contrast than amplitude con contrast, almost always. And so having both is really terrific. Yes, you're absolutely right. Hi, I'm Spencer. Um, so it, is this because you have a, um, uh, what is it like, what they say, it's a, a stationary phase approximation. So you have the amplitude changing very slowly compared to the phase information. Yeah, and remember, if your wavelength is very short, if, uh, you know, like um, Emma and, and, and Brendan and Josh, when they look at heat transport, if your wavelength is very short, a tiny change, even a picometer change in the surface is going to be a, a, a detectable phase change. So the phase modulation, let's say, of, of a transport or a mechanical property or, or such is much bigger at short wavelengths than it is in the visible. Okay, thank you. Maybe I can ask a question which I think is probably on a lot of students' minds, which is, can you tell us a little bit about KM Labs and how that fits into your world? So maybe I'll tell you how it was how it started. Um, so it started because as as young assistant professors, uh, we had done our PhD using dye lasers, and I once had a dye jet unclog and and blow into my face. <laughs> and so we were adamant that we weren't going to put a dye laser in our lab. So we worked with this new technology, Thai Sapphire. And with our students, we figured out how to make a really robust 10 femtosecond laser. And the other laser companies said that there was nothing useful that anybody could do with the 10 femtosecond laser, so they wouldn't commercialize. So our friends in chemistry departments and uh, engineering departments and physics departments, they were desperate because chemists need to look at fast charge transfer and other things that are, so they wrote to Henry and begged uh, us to share. So Henry wrote up this little, um, at the time, you know, you, there was no PDFs, it was pre-internet. Um, this was in the early nineties. And we snail mailed this document to all over the world. Uh, and then people in chemistry departments didn't want to build lasers. So they said, can you please make a kit? And so that's how Chem Lab started. I would not let Henry start it until we submitted our tenor, tenure portfolio. So he had to drag me kicking and screaming because I thought we were so busy already. But um, it's, uh, it, it, it's been good because, uh, well, it's good and bad as usual because look, scientists always need help because by definition, any PhD is at the bleeding edge of what's possible. That's just by definition. So we get a lot of people coming to both our group and GAM labs because they want help. And so, uh, you know, so we're, we're good scientists, but maybe not the best, um, you know, with, with uh, I would say with, uh, with, with industry, you want to be very narrow in one field. And, uh, you know, so it's been interesting, but, but worthwhile. A lot of what I showed today wouldn't have been possible without the company, because you do need to engineer to a level to make the microscope super stable. Who is your main customer? Uh, just different people. We have a lot of people coming to us. Everybody wants something different. That's the that's the hard part. Every, everybody wants a custom ver version. That's that's the hard challenge. The email. Oh yeah, this is probably the most complex system we've delivered. Is is to um, emac, which is the top um, semiconductor R and D organization. Um, worldwide, gives you, it'll give you an idea of the engineering. Is that right? Okay. I do. I think it'll move. Okay, there it is. So it gives you an idea of the scale. So you see the femtosecond laser here, and then two high harmonic up converters. And then these are the, we call it the mini synchrotron beam lines. So this is the system at EMEC in, in Belgium. And uh, this, yeah, this, um, and they're using it now to 
um, push their R and D in you know spintronics and two D materials, and in fact the photoresist. So all the um, when when Henry and I were graduate students, um, they started the consortium between Bell Labs at the time, IBM, uh, Lawrence Livermore, and Lawrence Berkeley National Lab to try to make EUV lithography, which is the next lithography beyond the excimer laser, to make it a reality. It took until two years ago for that to happen. It was so hard. And uh, the photoresist that would be used to, to print the tiniest features in the chips, they don't behave the same when an EUV photon exposes the photoresist compared to a many UV photons. And so they need the, the kind of the, a tabletop capability to be able to develop new types of photoresists, 2D material, integrate different materials for different ar architectures, and uh, uh, an ex Jillian, um, Kevin Dormy, Kevin Dorm Dorney, some of you may remember Kevin. So he just got a Marie Curie fellowship to work with um, EMEC on implementing some of these advanced mic microscope techniques that I've talked about. Oh, I guess we have one more question at the back and then we'll call it a day. So at this um, wavelength scale, and you're you're looking at phase information like many wavelengths away from your target, are you worried at all about like a Doppler shift scrambling the phase information? So uh, uh, since since we want to have high spatial resolution, the NA is large. So and the computation. So we do worry about vibration, um, but the. You, you can apply corrections for like the stage not getting to exactly where it is. You can you can correct for that. Um, you can't correct for everything, but many things you can correct for. So, and it's often we're a uh, couple of centimeters away between from the, uh, there's a couple of centimeters distance between the sample and the detector. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thanks, Margaret, Andrew. for a fantastic colloquium. Let's thank our speaker.